Welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk here about esophageal disruption. Uh, really, what this means is uh, mechanical damage to the esophagus. Okay, and there are two major uh, syndromes that we're going to be talking about, and they are heavily tested on boards. I can almost guarantee you in the 200 and some odd questions that you're going to get on step two or step three, you will be tested on one of these. So very, very important that you know how to identify it and how to manage it. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you very, very much who have already donated. All right, so uh, these two should be pretty familiar to you, at least the first one, the first two. Uh, so we'll talk about the Mallory Weiss tear, we'll talk about Borhoff syndrome, and then we'll briefly talk about iatrogenic esophageal perforation. All right, so what is the Mallory Weiss tear? Mallory Weiss tear is a superficial laceration of the esophagus, and it's almost always preceded by vomiting or retching. Now, it is not a super common cause of upper GI bleeds, but the clinical picture, the history, is going to give you a very, very obvious, uh, it's gonna make the vignette really obvious, okay? So you've got a patient who's coming in with hematemesis after protracted vomiting, violent retching and vomiting, this is likely what you're dealing with here. Now, typically on the exam, they're gonna give you a vignette of a binge drinker who maybe stops drinking and then they're hungover and they start vomiting profusely and violently. And at first it's just regular old vomit and then all of a sudden it's, it's bloody. Okay, and this can, be, this can be anywhere from coffee ground emesis to frank bright red blood uh, in the vomit. So that is typically how it is presented to you, but I could easily see a question where they give you maybe a pregnant woman uh, who is in her first trimester and she's got, uh, she's got nausea from the pregnancy, okay? Maybe she's got hyperemesis and she's throwing up and throwing up and throwing up and then eventually this can happen. So this is a consequence of violent vomiting. Symptoms, naturally hematemesis. Of course, because they're vomiting, they can be dehydrated. So check that volume status. Uh, it's not necessarily because they're losing blood. It's just because they're throwing up constantly. Now, if they are vomiting a lot of blood, then yes, that can result in a shock. Um, they can also be a little hypovolemic uh, because of, the, uh, of, of losing fluid. So just keep an eye on that fluid status and make sure that you're providing IV fluids if, uh, if, if they are indeed, um, if, if they're hypotensive or they've got poor capillary refill or any of that. That's something you need to keep an eye out on your exam. Uh, so for diagnosis, it's confirmed with EGD, although often it can be diagnosed clinically, but you should get an EGD as the best initial and most accurate test you'll be able to visualize the lacerations. The treatment is fluid resuscitation, and then very important if you're taking step three with the CCS questions, make sure you're putting them on a proton pump inhibitor and an anti-emetic. We do not need them vomiting more when they're in our ER. Uh, you can do photocoagulation if necessary, if you see some active bleeding when you do EGD. Uh, however, in the vast majority of patients, this is going to be self-limited and usually goes away within a couple days. Uh, so um, it's very important when you are looking at the vignette that you, uh, and they're, they're generally going to be really clear about this, if you're dealing with a younger person, it's likely a Mallory Weiss tear. But if you're dealing with an older person, especially if they tell you they've been drinking and they say this is a 55 year old alcoholic who's been, you know, in and out dealing with alcoholism for the past 35 years, drinks, you know, 10 beers a day, then you really need to consider another diagnosis that comes from the esophagus that can cause hematemesis, and that would be variceal bleeding. Now, fortunately, the EGD is going to be able to diagnose that as well. So that's why EGD is really useful to us, but you should be able to differentiate the two based on the patient that you're dealing with. This is what a Mallory Weiss tear looks like. 
Um, so it's, it's not very obvious. It's just you see some bleeding. And if you see the bleeding in the esophagus, you know you're dealing with a Mallory Weiss tear. All right, now Boerhaave syndrome is quite different. So Boerhaave syndrome is a perforation. So this is a full thickness laceration, but it's really a perforation of the esophagus. Now, one of the things it has in common with Mallory Weiss tear is that it too is preceded by forceful retching and vomiting. However, the clinical picture here is gonna look a little bit different. So rather than throwing up, throwing up, throwing up blood, what they're gonna have is throwing up, throwing up, throwing up pain. Very, very bad pain. Chest pain, abdominal pain. It hurts really, really bad. So the typical patient, binge drinker, vomits and retches for a period of time and suddenly they've got retrosternal pain and it's severe and it's sudden. So this is typically pretty straightforward. Uh, that's a very unique clinical history. Um, so some of the other things that you can see is some pleuritic pain. You may see mediastinitis. You may see pneumomediastinum, subcutaneous emphysema, especially up towards the neck. This is all continuous with the mediastinum. So you can feel crepitus in some cases. And then this can even progress to septic shock. This has a pretty high mortality rate, even if it's treated. So this is, this is nothing to, to mess around with. Diagnosis here, you suspect it based on clinical presentation. Uh, if you get a chest x-ray, because these patients are typically going to have chest pain, you get that, get that chest x-ray, you should be able to note the, the pneumomediastinum. The most accurate test and something you should consider when perforation is suspected is a gastrographin esophagram. Um, that's less likely to irritate and, and generally a better medium to use than barium when you suspect that a perforation may be present. The treatment is emergent surgical repair. However, some uh, sources have said that if you don't have significant uh, symptoms beyond a little bit of pain, if you're not dealing, if you don't see pneumomediastinum, if there's no subcutaneous emphysema, if they're not running a fever, um, you can manage this conservatively with observation in the ICU. But on your exam, emergent surgical repair is gonna be the right answer. Um, now, these patients also need to be put on broad-spectrum antibiotics. Remember, the esophagus has bacteria in it, and um, there's usually vomitus, too, that gets is going to get into the mediastinum, and so this can cause mediastinitis. We need to give antibiotics. And so what we'll usually do is gentamicin and metronidazole. Those are good antibiotics for any kind of perforation of the GI tract. You could add ampicillin onto that, but gentamicin and metronidazole are good drugs to use. You can also use piperacillin tazobactam, but just make sure you're giving broad spectrum antibiotics. And then of course, IV fluids, NG placement, and NPO. We don't want them swallowing anything while they have an active rupture. Uh, and then if there's a pleural effusion present, as can happen, do a tube thoracostomy. But the big thing is surgical repair, broad spectrum antibiotics, and NPO. This is pneumomediastinum. It can be kind of hard to see, but it is right here. And you need to keep an eye out for this. Now this would be the gastrographin esophagram. They swallow this gastrographin and we take an x-ray. And what you can see here is the perforation right there. Um, now with Boerhaave syndrome, the most common place that you're going to see the perforation is gonna be within a couple inches proximal to the lower esophageal sphincter, kind of in the same area where you would typically see a Mallory Weiss tear. Now, iatrogenic esophageal perforation, I don't want to spend too much time on because it's embarrassing that us as physicians screw up. Uh, no, that's actually not the reason I want to avoid this. Actually, the reason I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this is because the management is pretty much the same as for Boerhaave syndrome. So basically, this is where we inflict damage upon the patient through some sort of instrumentation. Usually, that's going to be an EGD. Now, Iatrogenic perforation is the leading cause of esophageal perforation. In my previous iteration of this video, I said that it was uh, Boerhaave syndrome. Uh, that is probably uh, what that meant through the source, and I made that video 10 years ago, so honestly, I don't remember the source I got it from. That's probably not counting iatrogenic causes. The most common site of perforation, and this could be a test question because they're trying to incorporate more anatomy onto step two and three, 
The most common location of perforation when it's iatrogenic is the cricopharyngeal area. The idea here is that when you stick the instrument down the esophagus, one of the areas that the esophagus is very close to is the vertebrae. And if you have spurs on the vertebrae, on the vertebral bodies, um, that can, if you, if you press the esophagus up to that enough, that can, uh, that, that can actually perforate the esophagus. So that's, that's the idea there. Uh, like I said, similar presentation to Borhoff syndrome because pretty much the same thing is going on. Because this is higher up, you're more likely to have that crepitus around the neck. Um, but you should really suspect this when you've got a patient who's got sudden pain that came on after instrumentation. And this is why we observe patients after an EGD for a couple hours. Uh, but very, very important, if you've got a patient who's had EGD and now all of a sudden they've developed pain, um, certainly if they're developing a fever or something like that, they need to be treated immediately. Diagnosis, gastrograph and esophagram, treatment is surgical repair. Same exact stuff that you did for Borhoff syndrome with the broad spectrum antibiotics, give fluids and place them NPO. And then one cautionary note to leave you with, on CCS, make sure that you're not jumping to make the diagnosis right away. Always pay attention to the patient's vitals if they are fluid depleted, you need to replace fluids. That needs to be done before you go ahead with any diagnostics. So do not neglect your ABCs because that is a very easy way to get dinged very badly on CCS.